It's my pleasure to call to order the fall semester's President and Provost Diversity Lecture and Cultural Arts Series. Two times each year, this program now in its 18th year offers the campus and our larger Columbus community opportunities to benefit from the gifts and insights of some of the nation's most eminent scholars and artists working and exemplifying excellence through diversity. Previous speakers include John Hope Franklin, Bell Hooks, Kimberly Crenshaw, Colin Powell, Juno Diaz, Zadie Smith, Will Haygood, and the late Congressman Lewis Stokes, and many others. The President and Provost Diversity Lecture and Cultural Arts Series is a testament of the commitment of The Ohio State University to diversity and inclusion at the highest levels. And each year, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is proud to administer this series in collaboration with the President and Provost's offices. This year's autumn semester lecture is also presented in collaboration with the Center for Ethics and Human Values in the Office of International Affairs. I want to thank them for their partnership. Here to introduce this evening's speaker is The Ohio State University's President Michael V. Drake, and it's my great pleasure to introduce him. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of and support of our Provost Bruce McFerrin. It's my pleasure to introduce President Drake and to remind us all of the service of, his, of, of President Drake in the field of higher education that spans nearly four decades and includes senior leadership at hosts of, in, of universities and national organizations that are dedicated to advancing higher education. President Drake joined The Ohio State University as its 15th president in June 2014. His well-known 2020 vision for our beloved university outlined in his 2015 investiture speech focuses on access, affordability, and excellence with an emphasis on groundbreaking research, modern and effective teaching, outreach and engagement, and advancing inclusive excellence through diversity. He said in that speech that Ohio State must be a leading light along the long arc toward greater inclusion and justice. These words continue to resonate across our campus and have taken on deeper urgency as, as questions of race have engaged the nation. The entire university is grateful for his leadership. Please join me in welcoming to the podium our very own President Michael V. Drake. Thank you very much, Sharon. Nice to see everyone here this evening. Thanks for being here. Now, before we begin, I want to take a moment to extend my sincere thanks to the co-sponsors for this highly anticipated event. And they are the Center for, Ex Eth the Center for Ethics and Human Values and the Office of International Affairs. A round of applause for our co-sponsors. And uh, tonight's lecture is an important component of our annual President and Provost Diversity Lecture and Cultural Arts Series, which underscores Ohio State's efforts to promote civil and informed debate on important social and political issues. These are the kind of insightful discussions we need to be having to help solve the complex social issues that we're facing. And we see as the issues evolve forward and change actually day by day that they don't become any more clear or less complex with time. Our speaker tonight is Professor Kwame Anthony Appiah, 
a noted philosopher, cultural theorist, and author whose work is of enormous importance to our time. Professor Appiah was born in London where his Ghanaian father was a law student, but moved as an infant to Kamasi in Ghana where he grew up. His father, a lawyer and a politician, was also a member of parliament, an ambassador, and a president of the Ghana Bar Association. His English mother was a children's author who was active in the social, philanthropic, and cultural life of Kamasi, one of the largest metropolitan areas in Ghana. I took great pleasure in looking at the wedding pictures that are so uh, uh, stimulating and from a great age. Returning to England, Professor Appiah earned undergraduate degrees and doctoral degrees in philosophy from Cambridge University. And since then, he has published widely on moral philosophy, political theory, ethics, and African-American literature and culture. A distinguished thought leader on issues of race and society, Professor Appia has taught at Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Cornell, and Duke, and lectured at universities and institutions all around the world, and tonight actually raises his level and is able to be here with us at The Ohio State University. He's currently Professor of Philosophy and Law at New York University. In 2012, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama, who said, his books and essays within and beyond his academic discipline have shed moral and intellectual light on the individual in an era of globalization and evolving group identities. According to multiple publications, including Forbes and Foreign Policy, Professor Appi is one of the world's most powerful thinkers. He travels extensively lecturing on topics that range from multiculturalism and global citizenship to identity and courage. Professor Appiah's talk this evening will focus on dimensions of equality and inequality, a topic that dovetails nicely with the theme of inequality adopted by our COMPASS program this year. As our world struggles with inequalities in resources, in opportunity, in treatment along the lines of race and gender and class and more, programs like this are crucial to supporting sustained reflection and productive discourse on these ethical challenges. At Ohio State, we are particularly interested in discussions and these discussions as we look to become a national model for diversity and inclusion. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Professor Kwame Anthony Apia. Thanks very much. Good, thank you. Great. I'd like to say that I thought my level was pretty high already because I've already been to Ohio State in the past, so I didn't, I didn't need this evening to have Ohio State among my uh, um, uh, accolades. Um, so I'm going to move that, uh, move that aside. Um, our understanding of ideas like liberty, equality, and justice is shaped by our everyday social experiences. So when we philosophers talk abstractly about these ideas, we often miss what matters to ordinary people and what's central as well to the great social movements that carry these words on their banners. Thomas Hobbes, for example, referred to liberty as, quote, the absence of external impediments of motion. But liberty, the watchword of the American Revolution, was a passionate concern for the revolutionaries because they felt burdened by the impositions of a colonial monarchy impediments of motion doesn't really get at it. What Jefferson, uh, uh, when Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence, he complained that King George was encouraging the slaves, quote, to rise in arms and to purchase that liberty of which King George had deprived them by murdering the people on whom he also obtruded them, thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. So Jefferson surely acknowledges here some of the tensions in the American appeal to liberty. 
uh, though his, uh, through his recognition that it was something that was denied not only to him and his fellow colonists, but also to the enslaved. And that is no doubt the reason that the Congress uh, deleted these unfamiliar words from the version of the Declaration that we know today. Uh, liberty was, as much as anything else, a status that distinguished the free from the enslaved. The master's rank was dependent on the recognition of his dominion by the enslaved and the indentured. This is a Hegelian point for those who keep track of such things. His freedom was in part not just, an, the master's freedom was, was in part not just an issue of what he could command, but of how he was thought of by others. It involved powers and capacities, yes, but also a particular kind of social regard. And this is only one of the many places in which our American understanding of freedom is intertwined with our experience of slavery. My aim in this talk will be to canvas a diverse range of ways in which appeals to equality can be construed in a society like ours. Equality, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you, is a complex idea. Some forms of equality, as I'll argue, are not morally required for a decent society. Indeed, in some contexts, I think equality is not even desirable. Very often, we should accept the appeal to equality then, but sometimes we shouldn't. We need to make distinctions. Hence, as my title announces, my enthusiasm for equality has limits. Our American understanding of equality is rooted, as I said, like our understanding of liberty, in the history of a slave republic. What's great about being a master is opposed to what is awful about being enslaved. The enslaved person is indeed constrained by the master's power which the state supports. That's one negative feature of her situation. But she is also denied both the respect of others and what John Rawls called the social bases of self-respect as well. She cannot plan her life. She lacks autonomy. She is not the mistress of her own fate. The state does not protect her from physical abuse. She cannot own property. Each of these negatives is the complement of positive goods that a life of freedom brings. Not receiving cash for your labor is the least of the problems of slavery. Similarly, in the long struggle for equality in the domain of gender, it's specific patriarchal institutions that help us to see what men had that was worth having, and we understand it best by imagining or experiencing its lack. Consider the legal doctrine of coverture in England, for example, which meant, as Blackstone remarks in his commentaries, that, and I quote, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. Until the Married Women's Property Act of 1870, married women in England literally couldn't own property. So they lacked rights and powers that most men assumed, uh, with the exception of uh, Queen Victoria. In taking for granted, I mean, who was a married woman, but uh, owned an awful lot of property, um, in taking for granted that he could not own a book, I'm sorry, that he could own a book, a tool, a home, a man might simply not have noticed and therefore might not value these capacities that a married woman lacked. And one very natural way to come to see the value of it was to reflect on the experience of women who lacked it. So there is a second important point about the evolution of our understanding of these moral political concepts. Not only is our grasp of a good embedded in concrete social relations, often the very point of the good its goodness, so to speak, is understood first and best when we grasp what a life is like in which that good is lacking. Equality is like liberty here, both in being embedded in social relations and in being best understood through recognizing what's bad about not having it. In the slogan of the French Revolution, égalité was not an abstraction. In 1789, the Chancellor of France, in opening the last meeting of the Estates General, 
declared all occupations were honorable. Edmund Burke in England, responding a year later uh, to what he called disparagingly this oratorical flourish, objected vigorously. Quote, in a, this is from um, the uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France. In asserting that anything is honorable, we imply some distinction in its favor. The occupation of a hairdresser cannot be a matter of honor to any person, to say nothing of another, uh, the number of other servile employments. Such descriptions of men ought not to suffer oppression from the state, but the state suffers oppression if such as they, either individually or collectively, are permitted to rule. So Burke's fundamental point here was that social standing, as he conceived of it, was intrinsically hierarchical. You could only be of high rank if someone ranked lower. Burke saw the French Revolution aimed to reject that hierarchical idea of status, aimed to treat people in service professions, making wigs and cutting hair, as if they had the same standing as members of the aristocracy. Equality pointed to something those ordinary folk knew through experiencing the condescension of people like Burke that they did not have. Burke thought of high social standing as required in order to have the right to govern. But what the revolutionaries were after wasn't really a government of hairdressers, even though they could now finally imagine such a thing. What they cared about was not so much a change in the political system as a revolution in social relations. After the revolution in France, as in America, the ordinary male citizen no longer needed to admit the social superiority of an aristocracy. Our constitution forbids both federal and state governments from issuing titles of nobility. Dueling was associated in Anglo-American culture with the superior status of the gentleman. So in the 19th century, election statutes or constitutions in a number of states made convictions for dueling a bar to public office. If you had duels, you didn't understand what it was to live in a democratic culture. And since 1891, for example, public officials in Kentucky, whether they're entering the legislature or registering as lawyers, have to swear an oath that includes these words, I have not fought a duel with deadly weapons within this state nor out of it. And it's turned out to be impossible to repeal that uh, element of the Kentucky Constitution. Equality then, as the motive power of these revolutions, was about the democratization of society, not just the organization of government. Given the persistence of hierarchies of race and gender and class in our country, it's obviously a process whose actual implementation is hardly complete. Philosophers speak of egalitarianism in the domain of what we call distributive justice as a view about the ways in which social goods are distributed. Usually, the conversation turns quickly to matters of wealth. But as Burke saw, what was to be equalized in the French Revolution was honor. And he thought the idea of everyone having equal honor was self-evidently absurd. Was he right? Well, part of what was at stake here can be traced in the shifting meaning of two English words, honor and dignity, which at the time of these democratic revolutions were roughly synonymous. A mid 18th century edition of Dr. Johnson's English Dictionary defines honor as dignity, high rank. You turn to the entry for dignity and you get rank of elevation, grandeur of mien, elevation of aspect. None of these could be inherent in everyone. Elevation of rank is something that you can have only if others are ranked below you. Dignity, on the other hand, as we now understand it, is the possession not just of the honorable, but of all of us. As the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says in its very first article, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity. Well, as I argued in, in my book, The Honor Code, both honor and dignity are best understood as rights to respect. So the democratic leveling that Burke worried about was a matter, I think, of assigning certain rights to respect to all men and eventually women. And what is it for a person to be respected? Well, most abstractly, but this abstraction like Hobbes's is too abstract perhaps to be of much use, but still, most abstractly, 
To be respected is to be regarded in a way that reflects some normatively salient fact about you. And so, by implication, to be treated in the ways made appropriate by that regard. Dignity has come to be used as the term for those rights to respect that derive from the morally salient features normal human beings share, which have at their heart the ability to suffer, love, and seek meaning, and the need for nourishment, self-respect, shelter, and sociability, but which include, no doubt, a great deal more. We are equal in dignity because we humans share these features, and so it is appropriate to bear them in mind in responding to every one of us, not just to some small class of the honorable. Honor, on the other hand, has to do with rights to a very particular form of respect now, which uh, the philosopher Stephen Darwall dubbed appraisal respect. Appraisal respect is a form of esteem that we have for those who display certain excellences. As we can see, I think, it is part of what it is to value something that we're bound to display appraisal respect for those who embody or advance that value to a high degree. Since excellences are intrinsically comparative, people will inevitably be ranked through these appraisals, and so to honor someone is to regard them as in some respect better than people who embody or advance the value less. So equality here seems conceptually out of place. And there is something right, therefore, about Burke's view, that honor cannot be fully democratized. It does have aspects that are intrinsically hierarchical. But there is, as you will be glad to hear, in my opinion, a good deal wrong with Burke's view as well. To begin with, a person's uh, profession is not relevant to the question whether he or she can exhibit excellences that deserve a positive appraisal. Indeed, since professions are by their very nature activities in which one can excel, there will be a form of honor appropriate to the finest hairdressers and so mutatis mutandis for all the professions and occupations. And while a gentleman's education may help prepare you for rule, it is practical wisdom and other developed talents and not the social standing that once came from high birth that entitles you to honor. Being born to a duchess is not an excellence, however nice it is to know that you, once, you one day might inherit a dukedom. So my first conclusion about equality is that honor cannot be equally distributed, but dignity can. A second, which we've just noticed, is that societies can uh, assign honor to the wrong people. One form of democratization of society, a way that was important in the democratic revolutions of the late 18th century, is to abandon the practice of honoring people for properties that do not reflect excellences. I repeat, being born to a duchess is not an excellence. This is what social egalitarianism aims for. And it's harder than you might realize if you think it is only a question of social class and ranking gentlemen and ladies, as Burke did, about what he would have called the lower orders. Honoring blacks less than whites, women less than men, Dalits less than Brahmins, Muslims less than Christians, Mexicans less than Amer North Americans, gays less than straights. All these continue to be a routine feature of the current world. If we believe in this egalitarian ideal, we should be against all of them. And there are two kinds of mistakes here. One is to treat a feature of a person as relevant to what respect is due to them when it isn't. That's what's wrong with racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, Islamophobia, and the rest. They deny the equal dignity of, honored, of a dishonored class of persons. But there's a different mistake, which is to let special social identity get in the way of a proper appraisal of someone's excellences. This is to deny um, honor where it is owed. You're failing to grant someone, as we say, due respect, the respect that's due to them. So I've been discussing what it is to relate to one another as equals. I want to turn now to equality in the distribution of goods. And so it seems to me there are many distinct issues here which depend both on what goods you are distributing and uh, in what capacity you are distributing them. 
Let's start with the moral equality of all persons. This has to do with our actions toward others, not as individuals, but as our everyday selves. This is one of the places where the negative, I think, dominates the positive in our conceptual understanding. For to say that we're moral equals is to say that in dealing with people, we should not take into account what is morally irrelevant, and what is morally irrelevant and when it is irrelevant, is something that we only learn through social experience, and communities learn this through time. Once in India, being an outcast was regarded as a reason for your well-being to count less than those of others. Now, at least so far as the law goes in India, that uh, is on the list of prohibited reasons for thinking that somebody, uh, that their well-being doesn't matter. Of course, lots of Indians still think it does, and there's a continuing problem of attitudes and Dalits in India. Uh, so we, again, this is one of the many places where progress uh, still needs to be made. Gender is now on the prohibited list in the eyes of many people around the world, except when it comes to erotic life, where we largely continue to believe that it is morally appropriate to respond to people in virtue of their gender. But not everyone accepts this restriction on the relevance of gender yet either. The point of moral equality is not to insist that you treat everyone the same, it's that there are impermissible reasons for treating people differently. Among the permissible reasons for treating people differently in private life are many forms of affiliation. You're entitled to take more interest in your own children than in children in general. So family matters. And uh, so do friendship, entitled to take more interest in your friends than in random strangers. Uh, you're entitled to take more interest in fellow citizens than in citizens of other places. Uh, your profession can be a basis for caring more about people. And so can simple preference. All of these can be proper grounds for treating people differently in some private contexts, provided we give everybody what is morally their due, which usually means not denying anything to somebody on the basis of an impermissible reason. Moral equality is one thing, though, and legal equality is quite another. As far as the state is concerned, the issue is that the law and its officers should treat people differently only where there is both a morally and a legally permissible reason to do so. We may make distinctions when they are relevant. There's nothing wrong in treating thieves differently from the law abiding. But our anti-discrimination norms require us not to sentence blacks and whites, men and women, rich and poor, differently for the very same crimes. Our norms uh, forbid invidious discrimination on these grounds. Our norms also require us to pursue wrongdoing with the same vigor, independently of social identity. In the sphere of political deliberation, our capacity to influence the outcome should reflect the quality of our arguments and how effectively we make them. It should not be a function of our race or gender or wealth. Why is that? I think it's helpful if you want to make sense of the stakes here, not to talk about equality, but to put it in terms of the different concept of neutrality. We should insist that the government acts, when it does, in ways that treat people of diverse social identities with equal respect. Where an act disadvantages people of a certain identity, they can reasonably ask whether they could have been treated better and whether they would have been had they not been regarded as a person of that identity. And if the answer to the question is yes, if the answer to the question is, would I have been treated better if I hadn't been a, an X, then we may treat the case as a failure of the necessary neutrality. If it's no, we don't need to. So I call the ideal implicit in this test that state acts shouldn't disadvantage people in virtue of their identity, neutrality as equal respect. It's probably worth underlining here how differently identity works on this conception for the state and for the individual. I think there's a lot of confusion about this, actually, in much discussion of these matters. For the individual, that someone has such and such an identity can be a perfectly proper reason for treating them differently from others. For their bearers, identities are important because they identify with certain labels, as a lesbian, as an American. 
Because identity, identification constitutively makes being a lesbian or being an American figure among your reasons for doing things, neutrality among identities, far from being an attractive moral ideal, is barely intelligible for any individual who takes any identities seriously. That it should be required of the state is a reflection of something special about the reasons we give for legislation and other state activities. Law addresses us, we say, equally as citizens. If the law permits me, it cannot prohibit you from doing something simply in virtue of a difference in our social identities. This notion of uh, neutrality, neutrality is equal respect, is very close, I think, in substance to the ideal of equality that is a long part of the established tradition of the liberalism bequeathed to us by the revolutions of the late 18th century. It's the equality of the American founding fathers when they were not blinded by prejudice. Sexism and racism stopped them seeing that gender and race were not good reasons for differential treatment by the state. We have learned better, and we are trying to clean up our act. This formulation allows us to see something important about the tradition of defenses of liberal neutrality that focuses on there being neutral reasons for state policies. The philosopher Thomas Nagel, in an influential paper on moral conflict and political legitimacy, argued that questions of neutrality arise wherever the state exercises its coercive power uh, against the will of a citizen. He suggested that in those circumstances, the citizen was entitled to a reason or a set of reasons for the act that legitimated it, by which he meant a reason that the coerced citizen should accept as a ground for the act. There are three immediate problems for this proposal as it stands, none of which, as it happens, is a problem for my idea of equality as equal respect. So I claim to be offering an account preferable to Tom Nagel's. The first problem with the way he does it is that citizens and states regularly disagree about what is reasonable. In these circumstances, especially, for example, when the issue is, as it often is, connected with religious belief, even if the state's view were in fact reasonable, it will not conform to our ordinary understanding of religious toleration to suppose that ignoring the citizens' objections adequately displays equal respect for all religions. That's because in the sphere of religion, one of the issues in dispute is often precisely what it is reasonable to think and do. Neutrality as equal respect is not open to this objection. Under neutrality as equal respect, we can make sure that we don't treat people of one religion as such worse than others, even if we believe their views are unreasonable, even if they are, in fact, unreasonable. Uh, I mentioned this example earlier today to some people. Many Jehovah's Witnesses believe that having blood transfusions leads to eternal destruction. Those who accept them, they believe, that is, those who accept the blood transfusions, will be denied an eternal life with God. We might pass a law that required the provision of blood transfusions to unconscious persons who needed them, even though we know this, because a policy of requiring us to establish consent would endanger the lives of many, uh, including many who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Of course, if we thought blood transfusions would in fact lead to damnation, we would have a decisive reason not to adopt this policy. But most of us don't believe this. Most of us don't think it is even reasonable to believe this. And in fact, not all Jehovah's Witnesses believe it either, because some of them are more reasonable than others. On Nagel's account, sorry, what's the issue about what's reasonable here has to do with biblical interpretation and how to interpret certain passages in, uh, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And I, my own view as someone who thinks about those things is that their view is a reasonable interpretation of those passages. But, but my point is, that's not enough reason to ignore what they think. On Nagel's account, if we are coercing people who are unreasonable, we have no obligation to provide justifications that satisfy them. We must merely offer reasons that they would accept if they were reasonable. Well, here, so it seems to me, Nagel's neutrality demands too little. Under my notion of neutrality as equal respect, Jehovah's Witnesses will also sometimes be coerced into doing what we think is best for them, even though, because their beliefs are unreasonable, they think we are doing great harm. But here, we're not thwarting their wills for willy-nilly. 
We're doing so for a good reason, having reflected on whether we could adopt a policy that did not thwart their aims. And so in particular, it seems to me perfectly reasonable to adapt a policy that says that if you make it plain that you are a Jehovah's Witness and you don't want blood transfusions, we shouldn't give them to you, even though I think that's an unreasonable view. And so it's not true that it is, in fact, the fact that they are witnesses that explains why we went against their aims, and so they don't have a complaint against neutrality as equal respect. It doesn't require us, in other words, this ideal to feign agnosticism about the beliefs of our fellow citizens or to avoid relying on controversial claims. It merely asks us never to prohibit a practice merely because it is the practice of some minority. A second problem with Nagel's view becomes clear when we realize that the existence of a reason that the citizen should accept, a neutral reason, can be construed in two different ways. It might mean that there was a neutral, all things considered reason, a reason strong enough in the light of all the countervailing considerations to justify the policy. But to insist on this would mean that we could never legally proscribe an act where there were citizens who rejected our reasons for proscribing it. For otherwise, the law would be coercing some people who did not recognize our grounds for legislation as adequate. Given the fact of pluralism, this would make legislation in many areas impossible. It's clear that Nagel wants us to construe the existence of a neutral reason for a policy in the other way, as meaning only that there are considerations shared by the state and the person coerced that favor the policy. But unfortunately, this makes neutrality too easy to achieve. So here's an example. We could prohibit the wearing of turbans on the grounds that Sikh, Sikhs face uh, discrimination, and forcing them not to wear turbans would uh, reduce the risk of that. This is certainly a reason for the policy, and furthermore, it's a reason that Sikhs ought to accept, since Sikhs obviously uh, want to be protected from the assaults of bigots, and so a reasonable Sikh would say, yeah, that's a good reason for it. But of course, that reasonable Sikh would go on to say that the wearing of turbans is too important a matter to be banned for this reason. So a reasonable Sikh might ask us to spend resources to beef up the policing of anti-Sikh bigots rather than forcing uh, Sikhs to hide in public uh, in order to uh, avoid the cost of protecting them. Now, the reasons Sikhs have for wearing turbans are not reasons that most of us recognize. Most of us, in fact, have no idea why Sikhs wear turbans. And that, of course, is the point. Even if we had sufficient non-religious reasons to support the policy that coerced members of a religious group, absent consideration of their religious reasons, and even if they took these non-religious reasons to be valid, they might still believe that our reasons were overridden by religious considerations. Nagel's proposal would count us as neutral because we had sufficient reasons shared with the Sikhs for the policy, but that's only because we don't share the reasons that they take to be the most important ones. If the Sikh asks us, uh, whether his religious duty was ignored because he belonged to a religious group with which other people have little sympathy, I think a fair answer might sometimes be yes, and neutrality as equal respect would then lead us to take the fact that the wearing of turbans is central to Sikh life as grounds for carving out an exception for them, as we would carve out exceptions where practicable for other religious practices. Sikhs, the principle is, are entitled to the same concern for their religious beliefs, true or false, reasonable or unreasonable, as all others. We cannot ignore their concerns just because we think of them as just Sikhs. State neutrality of this sort is therefore an important component of political equality. It's part of what it is to treat people of diverse identities as equals. But as I said earlier, we can take differences among people into account when they're relevant. The ideal of equality can't uh, be opposed to that. So what is an example of a relevant difference? Well, there are lots of them. I already mentioned one. Um, we're allowed to treat people who've been convicted of a criminal offense differently from the people who haven't been convicted of criminal offenses because it's a reasonable basis for criminal punishment that you've committed a crime. Uh, that's a kind of obvious example. Um, but here's another one. Um, Expertise on questions relevant to policy is a 
property of persons that might be relevant to whether we should take them more seriously or not. So one of the challenges for democracies is to figure out how to make use of expertise on the many topics about which the ordinary citizen has neither the time nor the training nor the inclination to make reliable judgments on her own. A thoughtful public media with intelligent and reasonable journalism would help here to rally people behind what the experts believe, but only if the citizenry is attentive to uh, intelligent and reasonable journalism. And both the supply of intelligent and reasonable journalism and people's attention to it are in somewhat short su uh, supply, I think. While there is much excellent journalism in the contemporary world, ordinary people seem increasingly to favor selecting guides whose personalities or policies they already like, rather than looking for signs of independence and objectivity that might suggest truth. So on many topics, from climate change to managing financial institutions, modern democratic politics has a hard time drawing on real expertise. Now, I don't have any very useful thoughts about how to put this right. I'm only making the normative point that it's quite consistent with equality to recognize that some people's views about factual questions deserve more weight than others. Everybody has the right to an opinion, we say. That isn't really true, since in truth, a right to an opinion on any subject has to be earned by a bit of thought and investigation. What you have a right to in a free society is the expression of your opinion, other things being equal, even if the opinion itself is one to which you are not entitled. But even if everybody did have the right to an opinion, that wouldn't mean that every opinion was of equal uh, value for public deliberation. So it's not part of a defensible notion of political equality that we must give weight to every opinion, equal weight to every opinion. Here's another way that you might think equality uh, figures in a democratic political culture. It seems to provide an argument for the universal adult franchise. I think that's right, uh, though for a kind of backward reason. Democracy in the popular conception is captured by Lincoln's formula. It's government of the people, by the people, for the people. All government is of the people, of course. But government by and for the people is a slogan that requires interpretation. And I think our experience as a republic has taught us to think about how to interpret that phrase. I'd argue, given what I just said about neutrality, that we should interpret for the people as an appeal to a non-sectarian politics that does not aim to advance some group interests over others, uh, which is not what we, of course, have. But by the people, once the people are in the millions, let alone the tens or hundreds of millions, requires some finessing. Even if we can make sense of the people's governing, and I'd argue that the involvement of many citizens in many of the processes of government makes this at least metaphorically appropriate, there remains the question of why settling who actually governs by equally weighted votes is a good idea, given what I just said about the fact that some people have better opinions on many topics than others. After all, the individual person among the people is often quite ignorant of the many considerations relevant to government. That's, as I said, why we shouldn't give equal weight to every opinion. Um, they might all be experts on what they themselves want from the government, but, not, but even here they will probably want things that can't be practically achieved together. They want excellent free public education and they want low taxes. They want privacy and they want the lowest possible risks from international terror, and so on. So even if they do know what they want, they may have no idea how to get it, and therefore no way of evaluating which candidates are likely to achieve their ends. There are many reasons then to doubt that individual voters will make good decisions, even about their own interests, and there's no special reason to expect them to be good at judging the uh, welfare of others. Still, that democratic voting will produce ill-informed or confusing results would only be an argument against it if there were a clearly better option. And the history of systems that don't allow the people to get rid of a regime through the ballot box is pretty awful. Indeed, Winston Churchill once said in the British House of Commons, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. 
The great virtue of an effectively designed voting system is that given reasonable assumptions about the variability of people's judgments through time, it does make it likely that all governments will face the possibility of replacement. And Lord Acton's maxim that power corrupts and the long history of bad government by men too long in power suggests that the circulation of rule among elites is a good. Even technocracy, or rule by experts, faces the problem that any entrenched elite produces, sorry, faces the problem that any entrenched elite produces, namely that the government will look to the interests of the governors rather than the governed. Plato suggested that we solve this problem by developing an elite that is especially prepared for office. But the real challenge to rule by experts is that experts are often uncommonly unaware of their own fallibility and unreasonably unwilling to accept challenges. Being raised to rule, the history of aristocracy suggests, makes this problem worse, not better. So I'm inclined to favor democracy, despite the evident risk that the people in, ag in aggregate will make mistakes. And once you accept democracy, political equality, which I defended earlier, requires you to give everyone an equal vote, absent a good neutral argument for uh, distributing votes some other way. I know of no convincing argument to that effect. So here I back into cheering for equality in the franchise by way of Churchill's argument that it is a feature of the least bad option. In the current election cycle, there's been more discussion than usual in our country, which I think is a good thing, about economic inequality and the distribution of wealth. Here I find myself in a minority in the liberal tradition. I do not see any particular reason to favor the state's imposition of an equal distribution of wealth, provided the inequality is fairly arrived at. John Rawls thought, on the other hand, that we should regard material equality as the default and allow deviations from it only when they advantage the worst off. Ronald Dworkin proposed that we should each start out with an equal bundle of resources and then allow inequalities to develop through fair market exchanges pretty much unconstrained. This seems to be, both of these seem to be interesting extrapolations from the ways in which liberal democracies have tried to handle questions of material distribution, but I'm skeptical about the default being material equality for a variety of reasons. First of all, there are great difficulties in how to measure resources in order to equalize them. I think that Dworkin's way of doing this, though ingenious, doesn't work. And anyone who cares, um, I can give you the reference for the paper where I argue that in detail, but it requires uh, detail because it's an ingenious argument. Uh, taking money as what is to be equalized strikes me as morally implausible because there's a very loose connection between wealth and well-being. But the real problem is that imagining a world in which some people have more wealth than others acquired by morally impeccable market transactions or through gifts, including inheritance, I find I can see no intrinsic reason for objecting, even if I were not among the rich. So here I agree with Robert Nozick, who argued in Anarchy, State, and Utopia that what makes a distribution of wealth permissible is that it is produced through just processes, though I should say I don't like his argument for this conclusion since I don't believe his account of what makes a process just but the structure of the argument seems to me okay. Now, my own tolerance for material inequality may reflect my rejection of an assumption that seems surprisingly common in American life, which is that the rich are cleverer or harder working or somehow otherwise better than the rest of us. Capitalism rewards the lucky as well as the astute and the industrious, and so I don't feel inclined to honor the rich as such. If we do honor them in ways that undermine the social equality with which I began, I think we're making a mistake. So we shouldn't so honor them, but we can leave them free to enjoy their money. And in return, they should accept that they are our equals in dignity and often our inferiors in honor. Now I'll turn in the moment to some consequences for the actual inequalities in the world, of, of the actual inequalities in the world that are, I think, genuinely morally troublesome. But let me say right now that much of the inequality of wealth in the actual world, of course, is not the result of morally impeccable transactions. 
Indeed, and this is a problem with the account that Nozick gives in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, on his own account, hardly any of the distribution of wealth in the current world is the result of transactions that meet his conditions. And so uh, nobody's entitled to anything on strict application of his view until we apply what he calls principles of uh, restitution, I think, which, of course, he doesn't say what they are. So we don't know, we don't know from that book who's entitled to what. Um, so one of the reasons why that is, one of the reasons why most of the distribution in the world is not a result of morally impeccable transactions, is uh, that one of the mechanisms by which the very rich have increased their share of the world's good in recent years is by their influence on the political process and on the shape of taxation and welfare programs in particular. This strikes me as wrong because it violates the norm of democratic equality I mentioned above. And here now, unlike Robert Nozick, I think that there are no moral principles concerning property that prohibit us from taxing the very rich heavily in order to reduce the unjustified influence of money on politics. Nor do I think there's any reason not to adopt measures to regulate the influence of money, whether it's held by individuals or corporations, on the political process. Whatever the merits of Citizens United as a piece of constitutional interpretation, it is bound to produce injustice in political arrangements because allowing people to have more influence because they are richer violates the idea that each of us should be treated mutually by the state. And treating corporations as entitled to such expenditures is in the end just a way of allowing their leaders undue political influence. The really important moral problems of material distribution in the world today derive, in my opinion, only indirectly from material inequality as such. The largest of them is not that people have massively different amounts of material resources, but that billions of them have much too little to lead a life of human dignity. So the issue, as Harry Frankfurt has argued, is not equality, but sufficiency. When people are dying of poverty, the problem isn't that others have too much, it's that they have too little. In a world of vast material inequality, where everyone had sufficient resources to assure themselves access to a life of dignity, there would be nothing, I think, to be gained morally by further enforced redistribution, provided wealth could not be used to undermine political equality. Precisely because Burke was wrong, we can be political and moral equals while having vastly different amounts of wealth. So I've argued that equality is a helpful idea in thinking about dignity, but mostly unhelpful in thinking about honor. So far as political equality is concerned, I've argued that it involves a mixture of requiring like cases to be treated alike in the law and governing by an ideal of neutrality, not among individuals, but among identities. What's important here is being clear about which reasons for treating people differently are impermissible. And when it comes to concerns about the distribution of material goods, I've said, that I think that we should worry about sufficiency rather than equality, though considerations of the justice of market transactions that distribute goods need attention too. Where it comes to influence on political outcomes, I think that what matters is not equality, but competence, though neutrality as equal respect should police our attempts to exclude even incompetent people from influence, and so requires equal voting rights for elections to public office. So, as I said at the start, I'm asking you to join me in rather less than three cheers for equality. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Don Hubin, the director of the Center for Ethics and Human Values, which runs the COMPASS program, which you heard uh, Vice Provost Davies and President Drake mention earlier. COMPASS is an acronym for Conversations on Morality, Politics, and Society, and in the spirit of conversations, I invite you to step up to the microphone here to ask Professor Appiah any questions you wish to ask. Um, I uh, urge you, if you're gonna ask a question, to make your question short and to not have a follow-up question uh, beyond that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, attending and uh, giving this lecture today. Thank uh, you. Dr. Apia. 
And I would like to ask the question specifically um, regarding equality and fairness. Uh, mostly in, with regards to their misconstruing. Uh, because often when I see people speak on equality, they uh, are mostly speaking with regards to fairness. And I think that's a bit disingenuous with regards to the issue of equality. And uh, if you agree or disagree, I would like to hear where you think one can draw the line between the discussion of equality and fairness with regards to the topics mentioned in your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one reason Don asks you to ask short questions is because I tend to give long answers, but I'll try to give, but I'll try to give a short, shortish answer to that question. Um, each of the issues of equality that I raised uh, means that uh, where, um, where, where the relevant normative demands are not met, there's a kind of unfairness. Someone is treated in a way that they deserve not to be treated. So just as the landscape of equality is complicated, so the landscape of fairness is, is complicated in that way. And worse, because there are other things that people are owed apart from the considerations of equality that I mentioned. They're owed other things um, as well, and it can be unfair to deny those to them. There is another notion of fairness which has to do with the idea of uh, um, contributing your share to the sustenance of social institutions from which you benefit, something like that. I didn't talk about that. That's a different notion. It's a very important notion, and it's one of the reasons why uh, we have the obligations we do to, uh, to behave in the ways that I suggested we ought to behave in respect of these various dimensions of equality. Thank you. Hi. Hello, Dr. Appiah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to say a little bit more um, on your views about global inequality. Um, so you've emphasized that, um, that you think sufficiency, um, so making sure that people have enough to lead a decent life should be the aim um, as far as the distribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. So do you think that is only within states, or do you think that there are responsibilities to redistribute wealth globally um, in order to ensure that as well? Good, great question. Um, so I do think that the right answer is an answer that means that we have obligations beyond the limits of our own state. I also think that the right answer is not just the question about distribution. So let me say something about each of those questions. I think I can say what I think the right answer is to what I owe and what you owe, uh, but it's, it's a schema. It doesn't actually, you have to do a lot of thinking to figure out how it, what it means in practice. But let me say at least it's a schema, so you know, it gives us something. Uh, my thought is this. We need first to think about what it would take for everybody in the world to have a life of dignity. That includes the provision of a bunch of minimal um, um, material circumstances, but it includes other things as well. Uh, it includes, for example, I think everybody has a right to live in a democratic society. That's not a question about the distribution of goods in any ordinary sense. It's about the requirement imposed upon us by our acceptance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which mentions democracy in effect, that everybody in the world is entitled to live in a democratic society. So that's one of the things that um, we need to identify as, as required. Once you've identified what's required, it's clear what each of us owes. It's our fair share in the task of making sure that that happens. Why this is only a schema is because the question of what's our fair share is hard to figure out, and also because there are many ways of, there would be many ways of securing a life of dignity for everybody. And uh, of course, what we need to do is to settle on one of them and then do our fair share. So there's a coordination problem. Uh, so, it's a, so that's just a schema, and it doesn't really tell you a lot about what to do. But I think one thing it does tell us is that we're, somebody isn't doing enough. Because it's not the case that everybody in the world has access to the prospect of a life of dignity. A couple of billion people in the world don't have anything like the material resources. Many don't have water, which I think is a, uh, an access to clean water, which I think is a 
to think about how important water is in human life, it's hard to see how we can live a life of dignity if not without access to clean water, and so on. There are lots of things. That, so, so what we know, because of the way I define the problem, is that we're not, somebody's not doing their share. Now, you might think you are doing your share. Um, maybe you're Peter Singer and you're giving a quarter of your income to, uh, to what you have identified as the most important uh, NGOs in the world, and you're paying your fair share of taxes, and your government in Australia and in the United States, where he lives and where he's from, is doing its part in, in helping to ensure a dignified life for everybody everywhere. And it's, when it acts, it acts in part for you, and also for the 330 million other Americans, or the whatever it is. How many Australians are there? 30 million? I don't know. Um, so, uh, so we know where somebody's not doing their fair share. But suppose you are. Then the question is, and this is where I think I, dis I disagree with, with Peter Singer, um, I think that if you were sure that you were doing your fair share, then you should not feel that you have obligations beyond that. Because the reason why these people don't have what they're entitled to isn't that you haven't done something, it's that somebody else hasn't. And even though they're still suffering, it's not, your, it's not on you, as it were. And you do have a right to a concern for your own life and for the life of your family and your society, I think, and your religion and the things you deeply care about, um, provided you're giving others what is due to them. Again, how we decide, and by the way, of course, it is also true that if you are doing your fair share, there's usually nothing wrong in doing more. Uh, but that's supererogatory. That's more than is required, I believe. So I, I think that the demands... So this shouldn't reassure anybody in this room, I don't think, because, again, whatever you think our fair share is, it's unlikely that we're doing it because the world is full of horrible stuff. Uh, and we are jointly responsible for making sure that doesn't happen. We're not fit, we're not succeeding. It isn't obvious that all of the blame can be put on Vladimir Putin or President Xi or the uh, government of Nicaragua, so probably we, you and I, should be doing more. But, um, but as a matter of the kind of the structure of the argument, I think first we have to identify what's needed for a minimum life of decency. This will depend, this will not be the same for everybody because given religious beliefs and other things, what's required for a decent life is different for different people. Um, also, disabled people have different needs for different uh, you know, people with disabilities, which, if we're lucky, is going to include all of us. All of us eventually are going to be probably people with disabilities, so we should care about that for selfish reasons as well. Um, so all of this is, is hard, but it does mean that once you've identified, as it were, what needs to be done, then you can ask, what is my society doing? What am I doing? What are the other groups that I can coordinate doing to move towards that end? One of the good things about living in the present, I believe, is that it seems perfectly achievable. That is, we have the resources, uh, we have some of the knowledge necessary to think about democratization, so we have the things we need to make it happen. Uh, and we need to coordinate. I think I answered all the bits of your question. Yes. I'm going to take advantage of the open mic to ask you a question myself. Yes. Um, you, your view is that uh, equality of material goods uh, is not intrinsically significant, uh, though it is important that people have sufficient uh, resources to lead a life of dignity. And uh, equality or egalitarian considerations with respect to material goods might be relevant in affecting equal political power and so forth. Um, I'm wondering what you would think of the following sort of egalitarian argument, that um, at least in a society such as our own and maybe in nearby societies, um, some measure of material equality is also relevant to the social basis for self-esteem or self-respect. That uh, inequalities, even if we somehow prevented them from affecting the political uh, system, would affect people's uh, conception of their own worth and other people's conception of their worth, and that would provide us with yet a different argument for why material equality matters. Good. I mean, I think that, uh, so, um, I grant that given the premise, the conclusion would follow. The question is, uh, though there's a constraint, which is that the, uh, well, there's an interpretive question about what it is to be denied the social basis of self-respect, and the mere fact that you, 
and deny your self-respect because for some reason looking at a rich person undermines it, uh, is only going to be a ground that we should take notice of in an argument like this if we think that that's an attitude that's itself morally permissible. Um, I guess that's where I would press. I would, I would ask uh, uh, why I should feel that I uh, am not worthy of respect because somebody else, uh, bearing in mind that I have political equality, that I have the resources for a dignified life, that I have access to clean water and security and all those other things that are necessary for a decent human life, why, what should be the basis for, for uh, thinking of myself as inferior, as it were? Why should I think of myself as dishonored uh, by the existence of people who've got more money? Uh, any more than I think I should think of myself as dishonored by the fact that there are some people who are smarter than I am, or that there are some people who are taller than I am, or prettier, or lots of good things, like what Aristotle called external goods. Uh, there are lots of good things that other people have more of than I do. Um, which of them provides me with a good reason for thinking of myself as somehow not worthy? I, I don't think money is one of them, as I said. I think that our society is too prone to treat the rich as if somehow there's something uh, intrinsically worthy of honor in having a lot of stuff. And I, I just don't, that seems to me, maybe I'm just too much of a raised in by Christians to think that that's, that that's a reasonable moral view. I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's a mistake to think that being rich is an excellence. Uh, to follow on that, it, it strikes me that there could be a, uh, a comparison between the decision of the Supreme Court in Plessy against Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education. And in Plessy against Ferguson, the court made essentially what, what sounds to me a similar point, that the, the decision or the feeling that black people had as a result of being confined to one passenger car of a train versus the, the car that white people were allowed in uh, was simply, was not unequal. It was simply what was happening in the minds of the black people right. uh, and, and understanding that, that law. Uh, by the time the court decides Brown versus uh, Board of Education in 1954, it is prepared to say that a law that mandates black children go to one school versus the school that is attended by, by white children is a law that is inherently unequal. So how do you, how do you make sense of that? Great. So, um, First of all, uh, I don't want to uh, risk uh, taking on an actual lawyer in these matters, uh, but uh, I would add in to the cases that we should think about loving, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, uh, Plessy was, the decision in Plessy was profoundly dishonest. Um, the, because the object of the exercise in maintaining segregation of public transport, public accommodations, was for the state to declare the, uh, it was part of white supremacy. And the fact that uh, you, could, uh, you could do something that was facially neutral, that didn't mention fate, white supremacy as a name, was irrelevant to the fact that in the social context and given the social meaning of what was going on, as Plessy rightly himself insisted, he was being denied respect he wasn't just being treated differently. He was, uh, the point of the institution was to deny him respect. Now, when Brown came along, um, the court could have uh, made that argument. It could have just said, look, this is part of white supremacy. It's pointest uh, of these, all these regulations, whether they have to do with water fountains or education or anything else, is to declare the, 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 the social um, inferiority of black people in our scheme and to keep them in their place. But, but they didn't do that, and part of the, and we can think about why, but uh, you can think about it better than I can. 
But, but one thing they did do was, was insist on providing some kind of empirical argument in the case of education that there was a connection between uh, separation and inequality. They didn't just, that is, they didn't say it was intrinsically unequal in the sense that it was, there was a conceptual connection between the different, the separation and the inequality. They argued rather that the effect of it in our society, given our history and so on, was. Um, uh, and then in Loving, finally, they just said, look, this is about white supremacy. This is about, this is about saying uh, black people, we don't need to fuss about facial neutrality and so on. Everybody knows what this means. And so, uh, and we, we finally, at the end of all these cases, we're just gonna say the truth, which is this is about white supremacy. Uh, that's ruled out by, by the Civil War uh, amendments and the, the changed understanding uh, of race in our society as a result of the Civil War, including the constitutionally changed understanding. And so, you know, you can't do that anymore. I like that argument better than the, than the more fiddly argument in Brown. I like, I like the idea that if you can, uh, judges are good at, uh, courts are good at interpreting social meanings, especially when they have a little bit of help. <laughs> and, and they can see sometimes that the social meaning of something, and that's, I think, a legitimate kind of constitutional determination. So like the social meaning of this is impermissible given our notions of, uh, of, of equality. So that's how I would think about it. I wouldn't, so that means that um, if it were the case that the reason why some people were richer than others was that there was some unstated but undergirding attempt to declare the superiority of the people who have the more, then, yeah, th th that's ruled out on my view by, by this other line of argumentation. Now, you could argue that that's the case um, in our society. Uh, um, the Gini coefficient of the United States, which is one of the many measures of inequality, uh, before taxes and transfers is the same as the Gini coefficient of Sweden. But then the government intervenes, and Sweden's much more equal at the end of the processes. And one of the reasons is it guarantees a baseline a, 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 for, for a dignified life, and the other is it taxes uh, high incomes more than we do. That's a choice. Uh, and my view is that it's, an argue, it's, it's possible to, to argue, but you'd have to collect the evidence, that in the United States, that outcome is intended in the way in which separate but equal accommodation uh, and education was intended to communicate the inferiority of somebody or other. But you'd have to argue that, you know, that's how you interpret social meanings. You have to look and see how, what, it, what it means in the society and how these things are produced. And if you persuaded me of that, then I would be in favor of the Swedish solutions. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in your talk, you uh, hesitated to say that there was any reason to uh, be worried by material inequality if it wasn't arrived at by some un unjust means. Um, and another recent Compass event, uh, Richard Wilkinson presented some of uh, his argument that Inequality, material inequality is harmful to the whole of society, uh, um, not, not just to those who are, uh, so he's talking especially about wealthy nations in which uh, those who uh, have less are not necessarily uh, um, starving to death, uh, sure. th this sort of thing, right? So I wondered if you had a response to that or if you thought this was on a, a, a related topic. Or well, I don't know the details of the arguments, but um, I'm not, I, I'm completely, open to these the empirical arguments that argue that uh, material inequality produces other effects that are intrinsically undesirable. But all I'm saying is that I can't see that it's intrinsically undesirable. If it has bad consequences of the sort that we should care about, I think there's nothing, unlike Robert Nozick, I think there's nothing to stop us having a 100% marginal tax rate. I have seen no philosophical or moral objections to 100% marginal. If it's necessary to achieve good results, I don't have any problem with that. But I want the reason to be that you've shown me that it's necessary to achieve some good. And, and the, the, the mere uh, uh, removal of inequality, material inequality, given that everybody has sufficient, and given that we have political equality, doesn't strike me as in itself uh, a reason. That's all. There are lots of bad things that happen in unequal societies. So uh, uh, perhaps I should stress that <laughs> Um, you know, philosophers are 
often perfectly happy to accept all kinds of conclusions. They just don't want to accept them for the reason that you, <laughs> you accept them. We want to have our own <laughs> reasons for accepting them. I'm just saying there are lots of bad... Look, here's another... Our inequality of our sort is very inefficient for the following reason. This is a point that Bob um, Frank often makes. Um, a lot of our... Uh, a lot of what the rich aim for in our society is not a good that is... An, a, a, an absolute good, it's a relative good. They want to have the best house in town. They want to have the house on the marina, not the second house from the marina. They want to have the first house on the marina. The second house from the marina is an awfully nice house, right? And a person who was only concerned about niceness of houses wouldn't worry about the fact that somebody had a better one. A lot of, especially in housing actually, a lot of the fact that our houses have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger for no good reason, we don't need all the space in a, in a McMansion, nobody needs all that space, right? But people want to have a bigger house than, the, than somebody else. That's very inefficient. We're, we're, we're competing to get these bigger and bigger houses. The bigger house is in itself not worth anything. It's just a status good. And we're, we're heating it, we're cooling it, uh, we're wasting stuff to make it, and so on. So the, 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 the concern to be uh, somewhere high in the hierarchy um, is doing terrible stuff. It's, it's wasting resources, it's wasting time, and also it's, uh, it, it reflects a view about what it is to have a good human life that I think is mistaken. I think it's mistaken to think that it's important to a good human life that you should be getting more stuff, or better stuff, than, than, you know, than most other people. But we have, unfortunately, that conception of, we have that conception of material value. So I'm against all that. Uh, thank you so much for the thought-provoking conversation. Uh, I actually am a doctoral student um, here using some of your work uh, looking at global citizenship. And in that conversation about pluralism and tolerance, I found that there's a lot of pushback about the level of tolerance that should be allowed um, in conversation that turns into a cry of westernization. And I feel like perhaps the answer is that your floor of human dignity uh, is a good response, but I was sort of curious what your answer is to the, the delegitimization, I think, um, that comes in the form of Westernization. Don't go away from the microphone. I just want to understand the question sure. a bit better. Um, so are you worried about people who say um, you're asking uh, people to do things which aim, you say, to make the world better, but on the basis of values that are Western and that you're trying to apply them in non... Is that the issue you're worried about? No. Yeah, well, basically that there's a conversation about global citizenship that gets turned into the, the, the call for global citizenship, the answer becomes, well, that's just westernization, and that's oh, not see. a legitimate. Okay. Well, so yeah. I, I think that then the dignity thing is very important. One of the, uh, uh, one of the, um, one of the elements of a good life is the right to work in your community to shape a, a culture. And um, that doesn't mean you aren't free to borrow from elsewhere or even to copy from elsewhere if that's what you want. But you should not be forced into that. And one way of being forced into it is uh, to be denied the resources to explore the options that you actually care about. So what's sufficient for, for adequacy in human lives includes more than just not being starving and having a roof over your head. So it means the materials for... Uh, we, actually, the, UN, the Universal Declaration says we have a right to a cultural life. Well, we do have a right to a cultural life, and that requires both institutional and material support. And if people who have that um, will take some things from the West, and they will reject others. And I hope we will take some things from them and reject others. Uh, uh, it is true, I think, it's just a fact that... Um, there's something to the idea that the, that the world is getting flatter. That, that the, for, uh, but two things need to be said about that. First of all, only someone who hasn't traveled much can think that there isn't an awful lot of difference left in the world. 
Maybe you just need to travel across town sometimes. Um, and second, new forms of difference are being produced all the time. And so the thought that everybody will be the same soon, that's just, I think, massively anthropologically and sociologically implausible. Um, however, if it came about that everybody in the world decided that they wanted to live uh, in a society organized around Confucian principles, um, who would we be to stop them? Well, we'd be the two people objecting, but um, I mean, what would be so bad about that? Well, lots of things would be bad about it, which I suspect mean that it's never going to happen because, because the, what John Stuart Mill called experiments of living, other people's experiments of living are valuable for us. We see possibilities uh, when people, well, Sweden <laughs> allows us, the, the Swedish experiment allows us, or the Norwegian experiment, which depends on a lot of oil, which we don't have enough of, uh, the Norwegian experiment in Sweden, they teach us something about human possibility, social possibility. If, if they weren't there, we wouldn't know that it was possible, all the, all the people who think it's impossible, even though it's actual in Sweden, would say, well, there's no example of that. Well, we can say there is an example of that. And furthermore, you know, there are other examples, both historically and, and presently, of different experiments of living. And I think, uh, even if I thought that the Confucian way of life was the best way of life, I wouldn't want to live in a world in which that, that was the only thing. Even as a Confucian, I wouldn't want to live in a world in which that was the only thing, because I think there are reasons for uh, hoping that human beings will continue to explore many possibilities, one of which is a reason that Mill mentioned, which is that people start out different. Um, one reason why the life of the Confucian sage strikes me as attractive is it's going to have a kind of philosophical bent. But if your main aim in life is to be really successful at tennis, I'm not sure that uh, a Confucian way of life is going to seem to you like anything remotely attractive. Please uh, stay around and join us for a reception. In the back, there are several very excellent books for sale in that corner back there. And I think you might be able to persuade the author to sign those books for you. <laughs> um, and please stay and uh, continue the conversation here. Uh, Professor Appiah will, uh, will be around and signing some books. And uh, uh, I hope you'll uh, enjoy the reception before you leave. And one more time, please uh, thank Professor Appiah for a very stimulating talk.